uh, dear friends, colleagues, uh, brothers and sisters, I greet you with all the greetings that you like. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wherever you are, whenever you are on this planet or in any other planet, inshallah. Because I know that with the telecommunication, with the technology, you could be watching anybody from any planet. Uh, today, discussion is about very important personalities. As you can see from the advertisement, is uh, corporate social responsibility. And one of the icons of this, his name was uh, Mr. Mahmoud Al Arabi from Egypt. And uh, I'm going to talk about him, about his journey, 60 years journey, as well as uh, we're going to highlight. Uh, some other colleagues of his in different countries. And because nowadays, a lot of those pioneers, innovative pioneers, visionary pioneers, are leaving this world to the year to come, inshallah, to the year after, inshallah. And I would like to thank my two colleagues, uh, Mustafa Maad, who is a young Syrian volunteer, and social activist, believe in civil society organizations, education, and uh, trying to tackle and help the problem uh, the, that um, helping to tackle the problem affecting young people. The second one is my colleague uh, Aya, who prepared the media material. So Mustafa prepared the research material, and she prepared the media material. Let us start. On this talk, actually, we'll be discussing uh, uh, nearly eight individuals, but I will focus on one of them with actually the understanding or the meaning of corporate social responsibility. And because a lot of them are leaving or have already left, six of them have left this world to the life to come, still the remaining two, I will just mention the names quickly before we go to understand the history of corporate social responsibility as Mustafa Mahad prepared this for me. First one is Hajj Mahmoud Al-Arabi, which we will be, we'll be talking about him today, he was born in Egypt in 1932 and died 9-9-2021. Uh, Second is Sheikh Saleh Abdul Aziz Al-Rashhi, who was born in Saudi Arabia 1921 and died 2011. Rahmatullah Ali. And this is a Rajah group, him and his brother Abdul Aziz. Third one from Kuwait, Sheikh uh, Abdullah Al Mutawa, uh, born 1926 and died 2006. Third one, Sheikh Abdul Latif Al Jamil, who is the founder of the Toyota Group in Saudi Arabia, born in 1909 and died in 1993. Rahmatullah Ali. Third, Hajj Ha'al uh, Saeed An'am from Taiz uh, uh, in Yemen, born 1902 and died in 1990. And he is one of the greatest philanthropists, or the most important philanthropist in Yemen, and one of the most important in the whole Middle East area. Uh, number six is Hajj Abdullah uh, Abdul Ghani of Qatar, who is the founder of the Toyota Group in Qatar. And he died also, unfortunately. I met him quite a few times. So humble. So humble. So humble and so humility. The still, the two people who are still alive are uh, Sheikh Jum Al Majid from Dubai, who was born in 1930 and is still alive. Alhamdulillah, give him good health and good life. The second one, Sheikh Abd Suleiman Abd Aziz Rashhi, who was born in 1928 and still alive. So I met some of them. I met uh, Hajj Ha'il Saeed Anam, I met Abdullah Mutawa, I met uh, Abdullah Abdul Ghani, and those three people that I met Saleh al Harwat, all of them shown humility and being so humble. I met even some of their sons, and they say having carrying the same character. Okay? 
So please, that's why I asked. That's why I asked Mustafa Maad to prepare the, the research material for myself. That's Mustafa Maad, which uh, I have his image in front of me. But for the people who are following me on the Facebook, I'll be putting this on the YouTube and I'll send it again on the Facebook tonight, inshallah. Uh, and I mentioned that he is a social activist and he loves uh, education and uh, the training young people and he's from Idlib inside Syria. But they have the vision to collect this data for all of us. Thank you, Mustafa, for the material that you collected for me. The history or the birth of corporate social responsibility. There are three stages. Stage number one, from the eight, from 1800 to 1920. This motto was, what is good for me as individual, as the owner of the company, is good for the society, is good for my country. This was stage maximizing the profit from 1800 to 1920. Maximizing the personal profit of the owner of the company. Is stage number one. Stage number two, managing the, grad, the, the guardianship of the company from 1920 to early 1960s. And in this stage was geared towards making suitable profit for the benefit of the business owner, as well as other stakeholders, shareholders and employees. And the motto of this period was what is good for companies, not for the individual, for companies is good for the society or good for the country. The first was one good for me as an individual, second good for companies. The third stage, which is from the late 60s up till now, stage of managing lifestyle and making profit is, is crucial, but not everything. Let us look at the value of the citizen. It will, it will look after the interest of the companies, the holders, and the societies collectively. What is good for the societies, good for the country. We went ahead from the individual to the company and the employees to the society as a whole. But in 1991, a young lady called uh, Carol Archie classified the corporate social responsibility into four categories. Economical responsibility, legal responsibility, moral responsibility on the company, as well as charitable responsibility. Economical responsibility when profit and loss making with activity. Legal to respect the local law. Moral looking at the employees' social welfare and the environmental protection. Charitable contribution to the social welfare system of the citizen as a whole. This is 1991. But I believe, I believe strongly that Sheikh Ha'el Saeed from Yemen, Jamil from Saudi Arabia, Rajha from Saudi Arabia, Mutawa from Kuwait, Al uh, Arabi from Egypt, uh, as well as Jum'a uh, Al Majid. From, uh, uh, from Emirat, all those, all those have applied the corporate social responsibility tens of years before Carol and before a lot of people. And this is a problem, and this is a challenge for you young people. Our pioneers apply the principles and the values but you need to change it into policy, procedures, and law. Carol also said, aims and scope of social responsibility. She made nine. First of all, to the owners, protected assets. Second, to the working force, just job, health care, and all the welfare of the employees. Three, to the customers as well, suitable prices, frank and honest advertisements and others. Responsibility towards competitors, which is competitors, to be very honest with them, don't go and snatch their employees from behind their backs. The suppliers, 
give them good prices, maintain a good relationship with them. Number six, the society as a whole, creating a new job opportunity for their children, the community, respecting the local values of the societies and their tradition and employing, employing people with special needs as well, because this becomes a must. I think 10% in most of the companies. Responsibility towards the environment, afforestation and increasing the greenery, producing harmless product and preventing, preventing pollution and using good manufacturing material. This is to the climate, to the government, observing the government's laws, to the lobbying group, be very honest with them, with the media and others. So these are the nine, nine aims of the corporate social responsibility as, as Carol Archie mentioned them. But I believe, as I mentioned earlier, that the eight individuals which I mentioned the names earlier from Kuwait, from Saudi Arabia, from Egypt, from Yemen, and from Emirat, have applied them before Carol put this in writing. Then Kofi Annan, 1992, 1999, uh, made a speech in World Economic Forum about corporate social responsibility. And he wanted to make a global compact for social responsibility. This became, this was launched in July 2000 by Kofi Annan, which was having four principles, four principles. Principle number one, human rights. Companies should observe human rights laws, human rights laws and principles. Two, work related. Abolishing child labor, discrimination and violence against individuals. Number three, environmental related. Encouraging environmentally friendly products, supporting environmental initiatives, funding climate protection programs, Number four, fighting corruption by um, fighting extortion, blackmailing, and racketeering. And of course, bribery. This was the four principles of the Kofi Annan Global Compact uh, for Social Responsibility. Are all our businessmen are dealing, do they, know, do, do they know what corporate social responsibility is? No, unfortunately, unfortunately. Some of them, they don't have a clue. They don't have a clue about what we call corporate social responsibility. Number two, they can react haphazardly by giving some helping initiatives here and there, but not in a planning or on a planned way. Number three, they don't have the giving charitable culture and social development. Number four, most of them doing the traditional charitable activities like feeding, clothing, without addressing the real developmental program, creating the positive social impacts and empowering the individuals and improving the quality of lives. Here, we have a responsibility towards this kind of businessmen. We need to educate them. What do we mean by corporate social responsibility? Let us talk about our star today. Hajj Mahmoud al Arabi as I mentioned, who died uh, on the 9th of September, Thursday, 9th of September, uh, 2021, less than three weeks ago, uh, about, uh, about two weeks ago. Who is his wife? Who is his mother? Who is his father? His father, unfortunately, died in 1981, when Hajj Mahmoud, 1941, sorry, 1941, when Hajj Mahmoud was at the age of nine. His wife, her name was Hanim Eid Muhammad. They were married in 1950, and he was, he was at the time 18. She must be 15, 14. This was the culture at that time. He paid her dowry 40 pounds only, 40 pounds. As he said, his furniture he brought to the house or to the room or to, it was not a flat, was a mattress, mat, and two pillows. But she stood like a rock with him for 56 years to be supporting him hand in hand, hand, in hand till she died in, on 6th of September 
2006. Rahmatullah Ali. Then his mother, his, her name was Hanim as well, Hanim Muhammad Zaid, who died as well in 1981. So people might say, why you talk about his mother and his, uh, his wife? I said, because those two individuals, one of them had him in her, in her womb for nine months, then she looked after him till he became a young boy before he went to uh, Cairo to work with his brother. The second was actually his right hand man all the way for 56 years. As people saying behind every great man or every great leader, there's a woman. Here there are two women. That's why actually here Islam taught us how to recognize and to value uh, the role of woman in Islam. That's why may Allah bless the soul of his wife and the soul of his mother. I will take you to flashes because I want you as young people to go to the journey, to go through the journey of Hajj Mahmoud al-Arabi from the age of three till he died at the age of 80 something. 80, uh, 80 something. 1935, Hajj Mahmoud was sent to something called Kutab, which is like Madrasa, Quranic Madrasa, which is Khalwa. From 1935, to 1942, because his father was a working farmer, not a landlord. And they could not afford to send him and his brothers to uh, school, to state schools. What he said, Hajj Mahmoud al Arabi, about the Kutab, he learned the Quran, he learned moral values, principles, etiquette, honesty, and all these good things that we learn. I don't know why governments here and there in most of the Muslim countries are fighting against madrasa, attacking madrasa, attacking Khalawi, like in the Africa, or attacking the Kutab, like in Egypt, which produce a lot of great scholars, such as Sheikh Sharawi and other scholars as well, and scientists, and, 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 and. So from 35, at the age of three, to 42 at the age of 10. He was learning in the Kutab. Then after his father's death, his brother, in, no, uh, his, his brother, uh, his, his, his brother in Cairo asked him to go to Cairo. But actually, let me take you to one journey here with his uh, uh, first business uh, mine, first trading. In 1937, Haj Mahmoud was five. And he was working with his brother, who was working in Cairo at that time, to buy for him firework to sell to the children in his village. You know how much his capital money was? 30 pence. 30 pence. And his brother used to bring this to uh, the village. And he used to sit in front of the house, display the firework, and made profit about 10 to 15 pence each time. So his brother was buying it for him for uh, the, the Eid al-Adha and the Eid al-Fitr. And this is where he started to discover his uh, uh, trading capability at the age of five, five, five. 1942, his brother asked him to come and uh, work in, in Cairo. He went. And so the, in Kutab, let me go back. In Kutab, the sheikh told them how to love people, how to love neighbors, how to love relatives, how to respect everybody in the community. That's why he said, he said, I love to be people's man. 1942, he went to join his brother in Cairo to work in a perfume laboratory, a very traditional one. For a month, he did not like it. You know why? Because he is inside the laboratory, does not talk to people. He told his brother, no, I'm not going to carry on with this. Let me go to uh, a retail shop. He went to a retail shop, uh, shop from 1942 uh, uh, to 1949. And he was very happy to mix, to talk, to deal, uh, to advise, to listen to people. 
coming to buy from him. What he learned from the shop owner at that time, uh, don't make big marginal profit, okay? Less marginal profit, but more sales to make more money. Less marginal profit, more sale to make money. And he was uh, humbly treating all the customers, which were actually most of them are actually students. You know why? Because this was a stationary shop selling everything to the student. So the shop owner, when he found that the people love to buy from Mahmoud, he stopped sitting in the shop and they went to the cafe and keep uh, uh, smoking hubbly bubbly and playing uh, cards and left everything to Aj Mahmoud and the shop was booming. By 1949, uh, Hajj Mahmoud uh, decided he wanted to go to work in another uh, shop. He learned from the retail shop, then he wanted to go to the cash and carry shop. He went to one of the suppliers, in the same area, and asked him uh, to, uh, to, to employ him. And his salary at that time was three pounds and 20 pence every month. But he asked for an increase of 80 pence to make it 40, four, four pounds. Before that, he started his job in the retail shop with one pound 20 pence a month, means four, four pence a day. He did work in the uh, cash and carry shop for about 15 years, from 1949 to 1964. Young people, young people and orphan at that age was earning, working 24 seven and actually earning three to four pound every month. In 64, he started to think that actually now we need to have our shop. We need to have our retail shop. He had a colleague working with him in the shop and said, how can we make it? He said to him, we need four, three to 4,000 pounds. Let us find somebody to give us the three, 4,000 pounds to pay the key money uh, for a shop so we can work on it. So they found two brothers, give them 4,000 pounds. The key money was 2,000 pounds and they refurbished the shop for 500 pounds. Then he, instead of buying the goods for 1,500 pounds, he put the money in the safe. His colleague told him, why you put it in the safe? He said, keep it strategic reserve because we don't know what will happen to us. He said, how are we going to buy our, our goods? He said, with my good relationship with the other shops, I will bring all this on credit. And he filled the shop, did not pay any money to buy the product, but it was actually was uh, bought on credit. His colleague or his partner became sick after a month or two and sat at home. But Haji Mahmoud Al Arabi, and this is a part of the corporate social responsibility. Corporate social responsibility in 1964. Uh, what? He said, all his share, his profit will go to his family. He needs it. The other two partners said, no. Then they broke the partnership and they made profit in the two years, 1964 to 1966, 14,000 Egyptian pounds at that time, big amount of money, split it between both of them, 50% for him and his colleague who was sick at home. And the other one actually uh, took the 7,000 pounds and they gave them the shop to run it. Then he went to rent his own shop and pay and uh, the key money for that him and during that time actually his partner died but he still was spending money from the business on the orphans and the wife as partners then the other two people could not be able to manage the first shop they saw they re gave it back to haji mahmoud and he took it from them and he has two shops now in 1966 has two shops and he and at that time he had to ask his two brothers to come and join 
common joint super alkas. Him and his two brothers were running two shops. One in Al Hussein, the other one is in uh, uh, Al Hussein and uh, the mosque. And you know, during these two years of partnership with the other two people before he uh, became an independent, he used to sell with 1,300 pounds every day, which is a big, 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 big amount of money of sale for every day. Because he learned from the first retail shop, uh, sell more, that make less profit to earn more. But something funny happened to him in 1954. Uh, uh, and he was supposed to be going to uh, the military service. And he received a notification to come to his uh, address in the village. I said, instead of going to the village, to the police station, I can go to the police station here in Cairo. He did not realize what will happen to him at the time. This was 1954, and at the time he was uh, 22 years old. He went to the police uh, officer, and the police officer thought that he was running away from the military service. And he wrote a memo to the military uh, department, and they made him to do, to make the military service for three years. You know what was funny? The year of 1932 was the only year where there's no one born on such year or in such year have gone to any military service in the whole country apart from Hajj Mahmoud al Arabi. But he was not regretting it because he said, I learned how to live the hard life, how to be patient how to look at difficulties. And this can make me to be more powerful or more stronger after that. 1966, he had his uh, two shops with his brother and was still maintaining, actually the looking after uh, the orphans of his colleague. Uh, so, at that time, the Abdel Nasser was the ruler. There was no export, no import. The stationary uh, business uh, was not booming. Everything was in the hand of the government. And uh, at the beginning of the time of Sadat, he started to ease it some, some time. But the, the smugglers, the smugglers, the smugglers were bringing a lot of electro, electric, not electronic, devices to Egypt, like uh, fans, like uh, radio, like uh, video machines, like uh, uh, recorders, like uh, television, black and white, and used to try to buy and sell. There was no export, no license, nothing, no, no, nothing, 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 nothing. And they started to make profit from that, okay? and to shift. Then during that time, actually in the early 70s, a young Japanese student was studying in American universities, Arabic language. He was coming to the shop, observing Haj Mahmoud in his shop. And he liked him very much. And he used to tell him, by the way, Haj Mahmoud, this shop bought 1,000, no, no, uh, 10,000 fans, go and buy them. He used to go and buy them, bring them to the shop and sell them. This shop uh, uh, bought uh, 250 or 300 uh, uh, black and white television. Go and buy them, go and buy them and sell them. So he was very serious in the business from the age of five. From the age of five. Then the man uh, wrote to you know how much he used to take a profit in, 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 the, in, in, in the television? One pound. In the fan, about 15 pence. In the recorder or recording machine was about 10 pence. In the radio, the small radio, five pence. This is where the marginal profit was too small. 
this allowed him to sell more and to earn more him and his colleagues other point of partnership from his corporal social responsibility understanding he made his two brothers partner with him in spite of the fact that the capital money was his own capital money so it was the dead man himself and his two uh, brothers one time he made an adventure and bought 30,000 video machines but the smugglers and he was actually selling them for 2,500 pounds 550 pounds the smugglers uh, and, uh, covered the market with the same video machine for 2,200 pounds. So it has to reduce the price 2,001. So they reduced it to 2,000 and he reduced his price 2,000 and he lost in this deal about 5 million pounds. And his philosophy on this is actually uh, don't keep the money. In stock, bring it back as cash. Then, uh, when this young Japanese uh, was very fond of him and uh, of, the, of the way he works, he sent two, two dealers, two, two, two officers or two employees from Toshiba to come and see Hajj Mahmoud. When they came to the office, you know what happened? They found no fax, no telex, no secretary, no structure. I said, What kind of work with this man? But he told him, he is the only one who can sell your product. He said, no, 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 no. They disagree. Then they invite him to go to Japan, 1974. When he went there, he was shocked to see the level of technology and the industry. And he wanted to build straight from a retail shop into a factory. Not only a factory, into a manufacturing factory. They told him, cool down, Haji Mahmoud. Let us Try first, try you first for one year. Then after that, we can talk about building or making the factory. You know, to make a performer invoice and pay the money, he has to travel to uh, uh, Beirut to make it and send it. And they found that he is a very serious man. So they give him the uh, agency, he become the agent of Toshiba, and he started to build his own factory and they were disagreeing shall we bring all the material from japan and make them collect them together and put them together or shall we manufacture the material locally he said no we manufacture it locally so they started well 40 percent locally 60 percent locally and it moved up to about 90 percent locally this is flashes or this was were flashes in the life of mahmoud al-arabi Till he became the multi billionaire. Practical reality of the philosophical ideology of Haji Mahmoud al Arabi. Go back to the madrasa, to the kutab, and to the khalwa, to the khalawi. He believed in Hadith Qudsi. He said, Allah SWT said, I make a third with two partners. And if the two partners work together, I am their third if they are honest with one another but if one of them cheat i leave let me say this the, the the wording of the hadith i make a third with two partners as long as one of them does not cheat the other but when he cheats him i depart from this partnership this was the hadith that's why he was so happy to work with many partners and make all of them partners to him the second was a dua. Allahumma ja'al ad-dunya fi aydina wa laysa fi qurban. Oh Allah, make the dunya, the love of life and the glamour of life in our hands, not in our hearts. Because if it's in our hands, we can control it by our hearts. But if it was in our hearts, we cannot control it by our hands. This was his philosophy, his philosophical ideology. Start. This is what he learned in the Kutab and the Madrasa and the Khalawa. That's why I'm insisting to go to bring the moral values and the principles for humanity through the Kutab and the Madrasa and uh, uh, the Khalawi, not through the kindergarten. The practical life, what he said, this actually about uh, 13 points. Minimum mar marginal profit, sell more to earn 
more. Minimal, that's why I was saying, I used to sell with 1% profit, 2% profit, maximum 3% profit. That's what make me to sell more and more and more and more. This number one. Love to work with people. He loved the people. And when the customer come to him, male or female, young or old, whatever it is, uh, rude or nice, he loved to talk to them. That's why his uh, first shop owner, the retailer, uh, the retail shop, left the shop for him and he went to sit on the cafe to uh, smoke the hubbly bubbly. Number three, merchant does not, the merchant, he never called himself a businessman. I'll tell you why. The merchant who does not make loss won't make profit. What does it mean? He said, because trading is loss and making loss and making gains. There's no, nothing loss forever and nothing gain forever. So today you make loss, tomorrow will make profit. This number third, prof, practical life, practicality in his life. Number four is his dream was gradual. It started with the 50, 30 pence in the front uh, space in front of his house. Then he went to work in 1942 for four pence a day, one pound to uh, 20 pence a month. Then he moved from that to the uh, other retail shop to four pound a month. Then it became in 1964, 27 pound a month. Then he moved from the from the from the from the retail job shop, shop to the whole cash cash and carry shop to his own uh, shop in 1964 to start to make his fortune. Gradualism, gradualism, gradualism. Number five, it is our business is about supply and demand. Supply and demand are the masters of the situation. More demand, we need to bring more supply. Less demand, we need actually to decrease uh, the supply. Number six, all these principles in, in, in trades, by the way. He used to do this with others, but actually nowadays it becomes like policy and procedures coming to us from Harvard, from uh, uh, Yale universities, from Paris, from Cambridge, from London, and they keep teaching us the thing which Mahmoud Al Arabi was doing. Mahmoud Al Arabi and Al Rajhi and Al Jamil and the others were doing it 30, 50, 60, 70 years beforehand. Said with loss, and don't leave your money in the market. That's what he done with the 30,000 uh, video machines. He, lo he lost 5 million out of 7.5 million. He maintained 25 to 30% of the capital money, but he managed to take them back to start again. Sell with loss and don't leave your money in the market. Uh, number seven, new meaning of partnership. I said, partnership with people, partnership with employees, partnership with members of the family, partnership with customers. Okay, as we can see, the practical application of the partnership was with his partner who died, but he still kept his money or his share going to his children until they became qualified from the universities. He used to say that we are no businessman, we are merchant. What does it mean? Because merchant in Arabic means tajir. T, le ta in Arabic, A, le alif in Arabic, G, le j in Arabic, and R, le hiya, ra in Arabic. Ta, T means taqwa in Arabic. Taqwa was piety. A, which is I, uh, means uh, what? Uh, amana. A, amana, which is actually uh, being honest. J, which is gura, uh, which is risk taking. And rafa, which is R, which is mercy. If, uh, the, 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 the merchant is pious, honest, 
uh, biased, honest, and uh, biased, honest, and uh, courage have the courage, and at the end of the day, merciful to everyone. The four. That's why I'm not a businessman. He never called himself a businessman. Remember these four: T A O, oh, Tajir, 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 uh, uh, Ta Alif, uh, Jim Ra. The more employees we have, he was dreaming when he was having the shop, or his a shop, we had a one employee and he was dreaming to make it 10, and when it become 10, they make 100, make 100, make 1,000. He wanted to employ them, not to make money, but to let them to earn money. And he used to say, the more employees that I have, the more money that we make, because of his intention. This is another principle of the corporate social responsibility. Uh, number 11, sales are more important than gains. It's not how much you make profit. No, no. Get rid of all the, the goods you have. Then buy. Empty the warehouses. Empty the warehouses. Even sometimes you used to sell with 1% or with the actual price or with less uh, yeah, was 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 uh, was the price less than the actual price to clear the warehouse. So it was lost. His message to the businessman was or is: when we will, when we all succeed, no, no. my message to the businessman is: your success is protecting me. My success is protecting you. When we all succeed, we will raise our standard and decrease the gaps between us and the poor people. I say it again. My success is protecting you. Your success is protecting me. When we all succeed, we raise our standard and decrease the gaps between us and the poor people. This was his philosophy of making a loss. Each one of us have to each one of us has to succeed. Number 13, trade is a relationship between me and Allah, between the slave and Allah and the creator. When we sell, we say, Alhamdulillah. If we not, we say, Allah will make it easy, inshallah. Rely on Allah whenever, whether you sell or you don't sell. This is uh, what we call the practical reality of the life of Mahmoud al-Arabi as a merchant. A special law, he created a special law for himself. What first point is give the employees what is enough for them. If five pounds a day is enough for them as they want, give it to them. If 10, give it to them. If 20, give it to them. Okay. Then give them incentives. Then after one and a half years, make them to be a part of your profit share. To share them in the profit. One and a half years mean that you actually uh, 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 tried their loyalty to the company and their productivity. Another, another part of his law, uh, the employees, when they come to, the, to work, they have to be happy coming. When they leave home, they have to be happy. OK? Number three, uh, we have to feel Allah in our employees. We are working together. They are not working with me. Okay? And we don't abuse them. We don't overwork them. We don't suck their blood. We don't make profit. And they make nothing. We let them to share our profits. Rahmatullah, Haji Mahmoud al-Arabi. And in his philosophy of his uh, corporate social responsibility, he said there's a responsibility towards the employees Number one, responsibility towards the climate and the environment. Number two, responsibility towards the state. Number three, responsibility towards the society. Number three or four, and responsibility towards the smaller businesses. Five responsibilities in his philosophy. I don't have the time to discuss all this with you. These are the references. 
if you want them. And my message to the young people is, is uh, the philosophical ideology of Hajj Mahmoud al-Arabi and his seven different colleagues in different countries, I mentioned them before, in implementing corporate social responsibility was based on the underlying principles of Sharia, of Islamic doctrine. Tens of years before uh, Carol and Kofi Annan. Tens of years. Most of those people were born at the first quarter of the 20th century. So, and when they start to become businessmen, it's at the end of, or the middle of, the uh, uh, second half of the uh, 20th century. And they start to apply it practically before Carol came at the end of the 20th, 20th century or Kofi Annan came at the beginning of the uh, second millennium or the third millennium. Uh, the doctrine, doc, doctrinal faith. It was taken from the philosophy of Islamic doctrine, okay? Which was extracted from the following, Islamic Sharia, its laws, principles, and different scholars' opinion. That is his philosophy. Two practical experiences of the guided caliphs, prophets, companions, and in the generation of the attendants and the followers of the followers as well. Tabi'in wa tabi'at tabi'in. See contemporary experience of others when they went to Japan. The personal belief in the principles of what? Reward and punishment, hell and heaven, evil and goodness, certainty and reliance on Allah, blessings and benevolence, lawful and unlawful, establishing the pillars and the ritual of the religion. These all principles came from his deen, doctrine faith. Believing in the occult, occult which is the al-ghaybiyat, which is the supernatural or metaphysical power. Now we are surrounded, I'm talking to you, and they believe that I'm surrounding a lot of angels in the room, and they're sitting outside watching me and reporting what I'm talking about to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tying up or linking profitability with sadaqah. The more sadaqah you give, the more profit you gain. Believing that the individuals and their wealth and their being belong to whom? To Allah. And all the wealth they have, they are entrusted to look after it. This is the doctrine, faith of the Arab. Number two, in his philosophy of thinking, his personal behavior and manners. He was implementing, and his other colleagues, like Rajhi, Jamil, Ha'il Saeed, Al Mutawa, and Awazu Billah, I'm changing this moment, Rahim from Emirat, Al Majid. Uh, well, actually, the manners of Islam, which are satisfaction, certainty, humility, mercy, forgiveness, consolation, leniency, thankfulness, forgiveness, bringing happiness and joy to the hearts of the poor and the needy, looking for and after the poorest reconciliation, benevolence, as well as others. This is actually his manner and their manners as well. Number three is who's the partners of Al Arabi and other businessmen, which I mentioned the names. Number one is the creator, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number two is the commercial partners from among us, the businessmen. Number three, the employees as a partner, as partners. Number four, the poor and the needy. Number uh, five, civil society organization. Number six, which is relevant government department. Six partners. Six partners, six partners. Then his vision was very clear from the very beginning. I want to become a merchant. 
a tradesman, and he did it. He believed in modern technology. I was talking about himself to some of young Google worker in one of the dinners here in Birmingham. And one of them, a very talented individual, told me, yes, you know, some of my colleagues found this man coming to them 20 years ago. And they told them, Miani, you Google? He said, yes. He said, I won't use your technology. He said, yes, how? I won't make it to facilitate uh, bringing or sending the money and the goods and everything good to the orphans. How can I use this technology to make the orphans happy, to make the widows happy, to make the poor people happy? He did not know how to do it, but he believed that he wanted to use it. That's why he went to, went to Japan, Rahmatullah he wanted to build a factory in Egypt to benefit Egypt, to benefit the, the workers, as well as to get the technology coming to Egypt. Living modern technology, following up Obadum, he never look his door. Anybody come, whether he's a business man or woman or a needy, they come to his house, his uh, his uh, his office. A charitable spending on different aspects. From Danny, I didn't want I didn't want to talk about his charitable giving. I but I myself visited one of them, which a, a hospital in his birthplace. At that time when I visited in 2012, it costed them 250 million pound before putting the medical equipment inside it. To provide all these services divided into three, one part will be uh, paid for, second will be subsidized, third will be free for people. In the middle of Abu, uh, I can't remember the name of the village, uh, Abu Rakhaba, Abu Rakhaba village, which is very small. Nobody knows about it in Cairo, in Egypt. Following the succession, succession plan, the strategies, policies, strategic policies, knowledge, and transfer. Yani, empowering young people, empowering them people, learning from their personal uh, suffering. Of course, and he went from being a, uh, 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 bo uh, uh, brought up in 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 a, in a in a family which is not very wealthy, uh, to become an orphan, to start working at the age of ten, in Cairo, on daily basis in the retail shops, then actually till he became a businessman. Young people, we only have discussed one individual, but that many of them, many many, keep looking, keep searching, bring them. Ah, it's your role now. Some of them, or most of them, like Haj Mahmoud, yani, he, he could not be able to, he, 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 he didn't go to uh, uh, schools. He was in a Kutab only. And some of them did go to high schools. How did they manage to achieve what they have achieved during their short span of life on earth? through some constellation. Some people are starting to teach them. Because at that time, most of them, I said, born in the first quarter of the last century, teachers, sheikhs, imams, mothers, fathers, relatives were teaching them. They learned it from these people how to weave glamorous texture for them built on creative moral foundation. No glamorous texture without being built on uh, creative moral foundations. Planting them, for them, uh, these moral values in a bursting land of faith. You know, all this Arabic metaphor, which I'm trying to uh, translate. There was no barriers at the time, big Islamic state from Andalusia to China. There was no uh, barriers or borders between the societies. No clouds were seen above their skies, no barrages or dams between their sons 
sons SUNS, no hateful Katish was living under their room, their moons, and everyone was insuperable. Obstacle against whom? Humanity's enemies. This was the society living under the great Islamic state at the time. They lived within a system where generations were receiving the flags of knowledge and the experience from other generations. Children receiving from parents, workers receiving from makers, followers receiving from thinkers, students receiving from scholars, researchers receiving from scientists, and future leaders receiving from current leadership. Their lives were full of suffering, but with patience, endurance with thankfulness, working with perseverance, working with, working with perseverance, consistency with satisfaction, happiness with gratitude, richness with asceticism, asceticism, virtue with generosity, satisfaction with altruism, serenity with dignity, and determination with insistence. I'll say it again, their lives were full of suffering, but with patience, endurance with thankfulness, working with perseverance, consistency with satisfaction, happiness with gratitude, richness with satisfaction. No, richness was asceticism, virtue was generosity, satisfaction was altruism, serenity was dignity, and determination was insistence. Young people, if we look, I was going to mention three questions. The three questions, one of them is the intergenerational, intergenerational dialogue. We will face when we look at the intergenerational dialogue, uh, the value-based moral, philosophical, pedagogical challenges. Why? Because every generation will fight hard to protect the philosophical thinking of its generation. Now it is wow, I believe in it. Every, every generation is very proud of their philosophical ideological methodology. Tell it fully, the ideology controls them. And this will make the young people of each generation defend the ideology of their generation with deadly dogmatic defenses. That's why they're different between the parents, the children, and others. That's why we have to create different kinds of dialogue, 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 dialogue. Number one is intergeneration dialogue between different generations. Number two, intra, intra generational dialogues inside the same generation. Number three, intra generational dialogues to be created by the civil state, the intra generational dialogue between the same generation, but in different countries. If a one enter and two enter, as well as other kinds of dialogue to be created by the civil state, the civil, not military, the civil, not a security state, the civil, not autocratic, as well as other kinds of dialogues to be created by the civil state and protected by state institution and civil society organization. Dialogue is the answer. How to start this dialogue, this process? We start building dialogues through discussion groups in schools and make that a part of their educational syllabus. We create debates between different youth groups in societies. We organize national awards or prizes on the different arts of dialogues till dialogue become a solid part of the social culture. This is actually the intergenerational or intragenerational dialogue. The second is regarding two things, building encyclopedic institution and creating the industry of making future leaders. We have to build the strategy to create young future leadership from your generation and generation to come afterwards. 
how to start this? First, data collection of whom? Of all innovative community pioneers in different fields of work who are socially responsible to the community. Two, building different societal platforms to manage such data according to different agreed criteria and principles. Three, producing the annual version of a book, what we call it, the book of societal responsibility, the book of societal responsibility, the book of societal responsibility annually. Number four, organizing annual prize. Why you only have a uh, Nobel Peace Prize? And we call it social empowerment prize. Number five, changing this path into what? Social encyclopedia for building peace and community security. From the data collection to the platforms, to the book, to the social empowerment, to the social encyclopedia for building peace and community security. And this will be the first step of the process of building the industry or the program of future leadership. I have a message to you, young people, because I believe that you believe in what I'm talking about. Okay? And you believe in what I'm going to say. And you have the ability to use what I'm going to tell you about. I have this message for, to you young people who are believing in the social message of life because of these reasons. What? Number one, availability, easy accessibility, and the extraction of information from different platforms. All the information is easy nowadays. Two, your ability to deal with different technological, technical challenges. Number three, you will see inside the time of your generation, now, 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 many other generations, now, now, now. Why? Because of the multiple diverse technological revolutions, which shortened the age of the generation from 20 years, more or less, into five years, more or less. And we find inside the same family, four or five generations, and each one of them will be more difficult than, and each one of them is living in different technological era of time. You find in each family, four or five generations, and each one of them is living in different technological era of time. The speed of following up with this generation will be more difficult than when it was happening with our generation. And this is for you to sort out. If you are 30 now and you have a brother or sister at the age of 20 or 25, another at the age of 15 or 20, another at the age of seven or eight, four generations, four generations in the same family. We'll give you more responsibility as well. What? A, creating and making or sharing in modern technological industry. Why should the industry of technology come to us from certain countries? We should start building it. But if we cannot build it, we have to master it and actually redevelop it. B, don't abuse, don't be abused by the modern technology. C, you should have social voluntary activities. You go outside, to work for the animals, for the climate, with the people and with others, to learn more about the society and to benefit more from the society. Number D, never stop learning. Learning is a never stop story, a non, no, no ending story. And listening to credible, experienced, learned people. Please be driven by your moral values when dealing with societies such as what's the moral values, humility, altruism, perseverance, givings, and social empowerment of young people. It's not difficult. It's not difficult at all. We're still having some time to work and achieve our goals. If the Arabi and the others managed during their lifespan to build what they have built of empires, 
سعودی عربیا اور قطر اور کویت اور ایجپٹ اور امارات وی کین ڈو اٹ اینڈ دا ٹائم واز نوٹ دا ٹائم آف دا ٹیکنالوجی اور دا ہائی ٹیک اور ٹائم از ٹائم آف دا ٹیکنالوجی اینڈ دا ہائی ٹیک بٹ ریمبر دیٹ وین وی اسٹارٹ ٹوگیدر دا پاس از لانگ دا برڈن از ہیوی دا سسٹنس از لٹل دا نیڈز آر پلینٹی دا ہارڈ ورکنگ انڈیویجولس لائک یو آر اے فیو The giving is not much. The challenges are unbearable. The obstacles are plenty. And the hatred is dangerous. Remember, when you work for the society, it is the message of the prophets and messengers of God. But the path of our solution are clear. Having calculated the steps, specific frames, and being driven being work driven being work driven their basis is faith their summit is serenity their dimensions are equality freedom and social justice their climates are goodness benevolence and social participation their trees are goodwill fairness and moral principles and their fruits are divine innovation I say it again, the path of our solution are clear, having calculated steps, specific frames, and being work-driven by their basis is faith, their summit is serenity, their dimensions are equality, freedom, and social justice, their climate are goodness, benevolence, and social participation, their trees are goodness, uh, their trees are goodwill, fairness and moral principles and the fruits are divine innovation. We are not going to give up, especially myself with you. We are going to be with you and next to you. If you know, or we know what to do. If you know what to do, we can go together. We have to work. Be patient. Care for one another becoming partners and rely upon Allah. And this will make us ahead of the young people of other developed countries. The plantation that you make will be admired by the farmers, every farmers, and will anger the anti-humanity disbelievers. Allah said, Allah has promised those who believe and do good works. Promise them what? Forgiveness and the immense reward, Surah 48, verse 29. So we are together, we are with you, and I'm with you. If, you're, if you are determined, trust in Allah, I will be with you if you accept me. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Thank you for listening to me for this hour. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.